War II, uh, I was inducted originally in uh, Aberdeen, Maryland, and uh, I was shipped to Mississippi, and then eventually shipped up to back to Merida, Aberdeen, Maryland, uh, to go to bomb disposal school. Okay, and what? 1944. 1944. Okay, and how, how old were you in 1944? Not to tell your age or anything, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was 22 years old. And you had also uh, become an engineer, correct? I graduated from University of Pittsburgh with a degree in petroleum drilling and production engineering. Okay, um, I was talking with, with your daughter, Beth, and she was saying that, um, you know, there was a need for engineers at that time. Well, the reason for that was that when I graduated from the university, I reported immediately to the draft board, and uh, I was surprised uh, that they told me they are not uh, drafting any people that graduate from the School of Mines and the University of Pittsburgh was School of Mines with Petroleum Engineering. And they said, go get a job, stay in touch with us so we know where you are, and uh, good luck. <laughs> and so I started to work. I got a job with Texaco in West Texas. Okay. And uh, uh, stayed with uh, West Texas, Texaco, for about uh, nine or ten months. And then it was bothering me that... Uh, I was not in the service, so I turned around and came back and volunteered. The draft board wouldn't take me, so they sent me down to the recruiting station in Pittsburgh, and I signed up uh, at that point for the military, and they immediately sent me to uh, Aberdeen, Maryland. Now, Aberdeen, Maryland was where the uh, original bomb squad? It was the original bomb disposal school was at Aberdeen, Maryland. Okay. Um, <laughs> but you didn't know that when you got there. Uh, I, I, when I finally got to bomb disposal, I had a, an idea of what it was about, but wasn't quite sure till I went through the program and I found out all I wanted to know <laughs> or needed to know. And uh, uh, after, I think... It was four months of training from eight in the morning to dark. And uh, uh, after four months, uh, they said, pack your bags, you're heading out. And uh, that's when I really began my travels at bomb disposal. And went to uh, Seattle, Washington, board a ship. Went to uh, Hawaii for a very short period of time. And then was uh, sent to uh, uh, on a flat bottom boat, boy LST boat, and uh, landed at uh, uh, Okinawa, and that's where I really began my bomb disposal activities. Wow! And at this point, it was nineteen forty-five. 1945. Okay. Uh, the um, During your training, there was um, some new technology that were, you were being taught to diffuse. Is that correct? The proximity um, fuses? Uh, well, we learned all about what we needed to know at that time. Okay. Uh but uh, in no way is it comparable to what one has to go through today to become an, uh, involved with EOD, which was the successor to bomb disposal. Right. Uh, in fact, I doubt seriously I could have gone through the whole program that they now have uh, in Florida. And it's tough. It's about a year long. Yes, sir. I, I graduated in 2014, but let me let me say that you would have completely made it. You were uh, 
we are who we are today because of the legacy that you left us. Uh, you left us with a, a legacy uh, when you, you know, served in Japan uh, very honorably, and you have some amazing stories that I kind of want to dive into a couple of those uh, because it seems to me that it wasn't just the bomb disposing that you had to uh, navigate. You also had to navigate the, the environment, uh, the people. Uh, very much so, very much so. And, uh, later on, I'll tell you a story which, in, in Japan, which uh, will always be on my mind. And that, when you want to hear that story now. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear the story, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, we got a call one morning to uh, go clean out a house that was full of warm uh, ammunition, Japanese ammunition. This was in Tokyo. And uh, uh, during lunch hour, uh, uh, the people that were working for us were kids, Japanese kids, maybe 14, 15 years old, very young. Mm. And they were eating in the other room, and uh, we were... I was with two other of my crew at that time, and we heard a click, and I knew what that meant was. Well, that click was a, uh, what I call a Japanese hand grenade. Mm. Uh, uh, it's shaped, it's about eight inches in diameter. Okay. And has four magnets on the bottom of it, and it was thrown like a discus, to hit a tank. Okay. And once it hit that tank, uh, the fuse would go off. The fuse was look, looked like a pencil that screwed into the side of that bomb. Okay. And uh, when I heard that click, I knew somebody, one of these kids had been fooling around, and we told them not to touch anything unless we were there. And it blew up and uh, took off two or three of his fingers. Mm. And so myself and the interpreter and this kid got into a Jeep and we went to a hospital. And uh, in the meantime, the interpreter had got a message to his mother to come to the hospital. And uh, I was there and when the mother came and she saw, she cried. And uh, I realized that mothers are all the same, no matter where they are, whether in Japan or in the United States. And uh, I never will forget that. That's I've had so, several scares, but that was the saddest moment, I think, when I saw the mother and this child together. Very sad. And... Uh, it's something I'll never forget. Never forget. What, what about the um, the emotions that you felt then? Was it? I mean, it seems to me like talking to you right now, you're still living that emotion that you felt. Um, you know, taking care of the, of this child uh, with the mom. How how the mom react to your your care? Your, your you know, I, you're trying to help. I, I, I really don't recall that all. I, I remember seeing her and seeing her break down. And uh, uh, when when the doctors came, we left and went back right. went my way back to work. Well, I think that is uh, that's a that's a very personal story. So thank you for sharing that. Oh yeah, Jerry. And uh, there's a lot of lessons uh, or, or things that I'm taking away from that. Is you know, you said it yourself that. It doesn't matter what country you're from or, or what background you have. You know, a, a child is a child. and A mother is a mother. And a mother is a mother. Yeah. Um, and that's definitely a lesson that we could uh, take today in, uh, in today's environment. Is we, we have a lot more in common than, um, than you would think. And the responsibility of, of a soldier and, and you trying to do what you could to help, um, that's admirable. Yes. So thank you. You bet. Your uh, your presence there in Japan was, I'm sure that meted, uh, meted was greeted by the Japanese with with different emotions. Uh, well, 
it was unusual, rather surprising, and some of us carried arms, uh, guns in our uh, boots and so forth for fear for what we might run into, but we never had a, any kind of an incident. Um, and uh, uh, the people that we hired were kids that, Ex Japanese were not available or ne never made themselves available, never knew who had been in the service or not. But to get work to empty out these uh, storage places where they stored the ammunition, uh, we used young kids, uh, like I say, 14, could it be 13, 13, 14, 15 year old kids. Mm. And they were very respectful. And they worked very good uh, as long as we watched them, except the one incident I just mentioned. And, and uh, uh, it was uh, kind of uh, an unusual feeling to see these young kids and wondered what we were doing, what we would be doing <laughs> at 13 or 14 or 15. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, Japanese, uh, as far as the war was concerned, they they were just lacking food when we got there. So oh, wow. these kids would come to work with us in and, and their little tin box with their fish heads and rice, and uh, that's what they had every day. Hmm. Yeah. So not, not much to eat? To the best of my knowledge, no. Uh, obviously didn't really know what went in their homes, but... Uh, I I assume uh, food was a premium to them. Were you were you able to uh, give them snacks from your your? Uh... Oh yeah, well we had those gourmet dinners <laughs> called sea rations. <laughs> yeah, and uh, once in a while the kitchen would send us give us a sack of something good to eat while we were out on the job. So okay, okay. You you also uh, made a very special friend. Um, there was the sheriff, I believe. No, it uh, was the chief of police for the area. Okay. Uh, and I can't describe the area to you. It was where we reported, where I reported with a group. Each day we went out. And so they would know where we are in case there was any trouble. But we never had any. And the... Uh, Chief of Police was uh, had we had to use an interpreter with I almost felt or could see tears in his eyes as we left, and uh, I know right before we left he. Uh, said, I want to give you all a present. And I said, well, it depends on what it is. <laughs> and he took these great words, pretty oh. ones, and he, he, he gave me, uh, I said, I have two boys, so he gave me two of those, which I sent home, and the boys have those now. Oh, that's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Wow. There's a, a mutual respect, even though, you know, a year prior, you were quote-unquote enemies yeah uh, how, how does that you're a young man at this time uh, how is how did that affect you moving forward in in your life uh knowing ha having to almost like switch gears you know between the enemy to now having a mutual respect for each other well the the uh, native japanese that we dealt with were those associated with our work and I had no social activities with anybody. And, and they were always, uh, at least to me, they're always very uh, respectful and very cooperative. And, and, and uh, I hope maybe you show some pictures of when we yeah. take a bomb out of the hole. And uh, uh, we had a lot of Japanese people help us do that. Which volume... Uh is it? You have four volumes of books there. Which one has the... Um... Let's see, you got... Oh, yeah, there's some right there. Got these. I can't 
Is it in that one? I could move, take a break. I'll find it and show it to you. I don't know which book it's in now. We're getting so many of these books. But there's red coming out of the hole with a So we decided that uh, we just had to blow it up in space. And you can see some of the explosion. We were a mile away. If you look here. I saw it just now. Oh, uh, yeah. That's it. Okay. That's the beginning of it, right? About a half a mile down the road where it was, and that was the start of it when it started to blow, and it made one hell of a racket, <laughs> I'll tell you for sure. There you go. Oh, wow. There we and go. Wow. That's amazing. Now, we were sitting in a Jeep and watching this. I heard something whistle we'll go over our head, and I uh, said, uh, oh, that's just one of the trees on the side of the sea. That's about, was 400 feet below the surface, where the, in the bottom of the hill there, where the most subs were, were located. And so you had a whole mountain that, to blow over when it exploded. And I thought, one of the uh, trees on the side naturally blew up and part of that wood was flying over our head. <laughs> and then the guy said, well, don't be discouraged, but wood doesn't whistle when you throw it. Steel <laughs> does. Still does, yes, sir. So <laughs> it wasn't even close. We couldn't find it. Or I, I, I don't think we wanted to look for it. We wanted to get out of there when that was done. So we Yeah, I'm sure. So how long uh, were you there, and how, when did you come back uh, uh, stateside? When did you leave Japan? Uh, I went right back to Fort Meade, Maryland. I was in the service a little over two, two plus years. Okay. And uh, uh, I went back to Maryland. Fort Meade, I guess, was in Maryland for discharge. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so part of this docu series, uh, this documentary that I'm doing is uh, part of the documentary. One of the reasons why I'm wanting to do this is to try to capture, you know, life before and then, you know, during and after being a bomb tech. Um, and uh, you went on to uh, another career, I'm sure, after the military. And I was wondering if you'd share a little bit about that with us. No, I mean, uh, uh, once I was sent to Baltimore to sort of the school, which was shortly after we traveled uh, from Baltimore, I mean, uh, shortly after traveling Baltimore school, school to uh, a big port out there at uh, uh, Seattle, mm -hmm. uh, I spent probably less than four or five weeks when we landed in Okinawa in uh, Hawaii. And then we were put on a boat for Okinawa, and I was in bomb disposal forever. I, that's all I did was bomb disposal work right. once I went to school. Oh, I, I meant, uh, so after the military. Uh, uh, after the military, I went back to uh, West Texas. Okay. And began my career as a petroleum engineer. And all in all, I spent about 70 years actually working as a petroleum engineer. And the last 15 was with uh, in uh, Colorado and New Mexico working for the uh, 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 Indians, and the uh, uh, Apache Indians and the Ute Mountain Ute Indians, those two tribes. Okay. And what kind of work was that? Yeah, I was, uh, when I did that, I, 
uh, was acting as a consulting engineer to them. Okay. And helping them with their leasing problems and their contractual problems and their drilling, looking after drilling on the reservation that other people were doing. And uh, uh, when I left, uh, uh, like I say, I had spent 15 years between the two tribes. Wow. So they, they needed, needed some uh, outside help. Oh, yeah, mo most Indian tribes that have oil and gas usually have help. Okay, good. Good. And uh, that's, you're there to try, try to look after them and make sure that everything was... Well, right, and help them because most of the, well, I don't know of any of the Indians that I ran into that ever got a degree in petroleum engineering. You know, I mean, they had other things to think about. Probably. Okay. And did, did you, uh, you did it for 15 years, and so that's, that tells me that you enjoyed uh, that work. It was, oh, I, I enjoyed my entire career as, as a petroleum engineer. In fact, I think uh, the fact that I liked it as much as I did was the reason that I stayed with it. I mean, I worked, I did some work in the North Sea, I did some work in uh, uh, the Middle East, did some work in South America. Worked on wells from one end of Canada to the other. <laughs> Pretty cold and, up there, I hear. Yeah, I, I was very fortunate to do something that I like doing. Yeah. Well, can I ask you for um, maybe a piece of advice for for people that are in, uh, I guess, in my position, you know, getting out of the military lately? Um, how, how how did you find that career that you love so much, and, and what advice would you have for us? Well, one of the reasons that I went to work sooner when the draft board wouldn't take me was I wanted a job when I come back out of the service. And back then, I don't know what the rules are now, if you were drafted from a job, you got an opportunity at that job when you came back from the service. Okay. And so that's why I went back and but I, I enjoyed, uh, I'm very fortunate, very, very fortunate to, to really have enjoyed my working as a petroleum engineer, and I'd do it again if I had a chance. <laughs> so would, would you say, uh, once you find something you love doing, to, to stick with it? Well, that, that's, that's nice, but uh, today, these kids that get out of school, uh, many of them take a job that they don't like to begin with because they can't have much of a choice in what they want to do. But I, I would say that there's two things. One thing I should say that we think about when we start to work by the colleges uh, when I retire hmm. and and the attitude today is you take a job many times over different places so that you end up you don't have 20 years or 18 years for retirement and but uh, Attitudes are different, Sal salaries are different, living conditions where you are located are different. Mm -hmm. So it's, re it's reasonable to understand that many kids have a hard time finding themselves and what they want to do when they get out of school. I had trouble with that myself. Yeah, well, it's... Uh, and I think if you like what you do and you want to stay with it, and you're thinking about retiring, there's nothing wrong with that by any means. And uh, I think the choice, if you're aggressive enough to want to go improve your station in life, and you're gonna have to move. There's no doubt about it. Hmm. Companies don't want you staying in one place at one time. That's a, that's a really good, that's a really good piece of advice, actually. Yeah. I, I think that, uh, as you mentioned that, I'm thinking in my head of, of how much 
um, some of the people I admire and that I, that I see their careers being successful, they've moved a lot. And um, what, do you th what do you think is part of the moving around? Is it just the different experiences in that career field that, that gain you more, uh, more, more of a skill set? Well, I, I think so, and that, to some degree. I mean, I, I, uh, one of the jobs I had was working in offshore drilling and uh, for two years and lived in New Orleans and uh, uh, I found that fascinating. I mean, that's <laughs> the Cadillac of the oil industry is offshore <laughs> drilling. You know? Okay. And uh, the only thing is when you go out there as an engineer, you have to stay a week or two out there and then somebody came and relieved you. and uh, met, uh, no, I would say if anybody likes drilling and production, yeah, you got to try working on some offshore drilling. You learn so much, and you learn how to live because out hmm. there you're living with not, nothing but a bunch of guys <laughs> that uh, uh, are waiting for their two weeks to be up so they can go back to shore. Yeah, I could see that. I could absolutely see that. Uh, you, you hit on something earlier that I wanted to um, maybe dive into it just a little bit more of, um, of people trying to find themselves. And uh, to me, your, your story is inspiring. You've, you've done so much uh, with your life and you, you've continued to, to live life to the fullest. Um, and so the mental health aspect of, of that is very important to me. Uh, do you mind if we talk about the mental health um, attitude that you had and like how you kept you know, staying positive uh, throughout your life? Well, uh, 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 a couple things help you learn to like what you do. Okay? Yes, sir. One is, if you're married and have a family and have children, you want to think about sending them to college sometimes. You don't get too frivolous and tired skipping around from one place to another. If you got a good job, you're going to handle it. And uh, I was fortunate enough to have four kids and uh, got them all through college. And, uh, uh, but it was never a chore for me because I liked what I did. Hmm. I liked getting up and going out in the rig. And I liked sometimes when we were in trouble and you have to figure out how to get out of trouble. <laughs> uh, and you feel good about yourself. And people get to like you too. Yeah. Uh, you got an unusual class of people that end up in field work for, for uh, oil, oil and gas activities. And uh, one thing for sure in Texas, I found out in a hurry. Uh, if they like you, they really like you. <laughs> if they don't like you, just get out of their way, okay? I, I grew up in Oklahoma uh, <laughs> in the oil and gas industry, and so I, I, <laughs> I second that motion. <laughs> That's very true. But, uh, you know, I think One of the well, one of the things about moving from one place, you meet different people, you you see different things, and and uh, uh, and if you're in the oil business working for a big company, they're going to move you around, and so you know it, it just never gets boring. It wasn't to me. Well, once in a while you get uh, upset about this or that. That's normal. That's that, that's normal. Yeah. But in general, the uh, the jobs I had, I, I just I love my work. That's uh, the only way I can put it. So, so one of the, the keys of happiness in, in your life has been uh, the opportunity and working for the, the the opportunity to move around and experience different places and different people. Right, I, I enjoyed that. It was part of it because uh, usually when you move around. Uh, uh, you're moving around because something needed corrected and something needed to be improved. So purpose. So we're, we're yeah, talking about purpose now. That's a purpose, and and uh, 
and you feel really good when you get something done and you, you, you know it's an improvement over what it was just like the the children and in the, in the teachers at the yeah, schoolhouse right 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 they, right they had that sense of satisfaction yeah, <laughs> that's true okay um well i don't want to take up uh too much more of your time i know i've had you for about two hours now uh and so if um if we want to pause here um you know we can continue this conversation on another day if you'd like to would that be okay no we if you don't mind let's my keep on going with the doctors and so forth uh, all right i like to keep on going yeah. sounds like a deal um well what else would you like to talk about oh nothing that uh well, I have a million questions I could ask you, but I, I want to be sure to give you a chance to, to share some of the things that were important to you in your life. Well, you know, from the time I got out of school and started to work for Texaco, you know, I, you know, I liked the work. I didn't like getting moved uh, uh, when I got ready to get in the Army, but... Uh, uh, but as far as having a family and so forth, and seeing your kids get to college and get out on their own, there's some degree of satisfaction in seeing it. And you realize you didn't do it all by yourself. You had some help somewhere along the way. I, I can, I can agree with that. Yeah. Uh, and now, uh, when I left the uh, left working for the Indians and moved to to Denver, uh, the life was quite different, uh, and uh, helped. Me get through that period of when you get up in the morning and you don't have anything to do. Hmm. Sooner or later, that gets to the point where you better find something to do. And uh, my uh, experience, which I think we talked about with my daughter in pictures, sending them uh, to the Library of Congress and eventually ending up in Fort Carson here. <laughs> was kind of a lifesaver and uh, uh, and I enjoy talking about bomb disposal because uh, most people don't know very much about bomb disposal. Yeah, I, I didn't before I, before I joined the military. Yeah. I, I had no idea really about it. And I, I enjoy talking to groups and you know, letting them ask questions about why you did this or why you did that. And for the past, for I guess it's almost three years now that uh, I've been involved in giving talks, which I enjoy very much. <laughs> I can see, it, I can see it in your eyes. You really and, enjoy it. And uh, uh, and I learned a little bit about myself. That there's another side to all the angles that you can figure out. There's other ways of doing things, and hopefully. Uh, 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 it, you know, hopefully it makes life a little more pleasant for you. The fact that uh, one of the biggest highlights is when I became an honorary member of the EOD. They made me an honorary member of the EOD here. And, uh, and most of the people I was close to then have transferred every two years. They move someplace else. Yes, sir. And I still stay in touch. Some of them call me, hmm. and I think the biggest surprise uh, I had was when I uh, gave uh, my talk at Fort Lee, and the, the general there was General Doyle, Hoyle, and there's somewhere there's a picture of her giving me uh, an award and uh, we shook hands 
and the picture shows us laughing. <laughs> and I said, if I accept this award, does that mean that I'm subject to being called up again? <laughs> and no, she said, no, yeah, you'll be excused. There's, there's some pictures somewhere. I think there might be in that one at the very beginning. Here's some pictures that I took when they were taken when I was sent into the equipment room at Fort Carson. Okay. And I guess not many people get a chance to go in there. No, sir. And there they took me around and showed me. I was so pleased. It's a minesweeper. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this is all. All those pictures up. I don't know where they. Is it the very beginning of this one? I think it's the very, very beginning. I think I saw it. No, it's on that one. Big blame. Take a look. We have the top one there too. Sure. And before you leave, I. Oh, there it is. Yep. Yep. Gotcha. Share this. Let me give you the one that really is okay. the classic of it. Of the whole. There's a general there. If I didn't want it, I, <laughs> I couldn't find it. Is that not it? I thought that was it. Of, of you guys laughing. That's it. That's yeah. the one. Yeah, that, that's the one I showed. That, that's yeah. the one. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah, just she, for again, yeah. She promised me they wouldn't call me back. Oh, that's awesome. It looks like uh, it was a, that was a joyful moment, joyful moment for a lot of people. Yeah, oh yeah. And they, I, 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 I have to say this, without question, that they have treated me, the whole Army situation here at Fort Lee and Fort Carson, you know, they, they've treated me like a five-star general. And, uh, when they want me to come down there, I mean, they'll send somebody up here to drive me down there. If I have oh, to wow. stay overnight, they put me up in a motel, hotel. And and I know that that's, that's not the usual way things are done, but it was something that really impressed me and made me want to, you know, help them all I could. I think that more, more and more we're trying to um, well, run the people that I'm around at least are, are trying trying and enjoying getting back to our roots yeah you know um, because life life can be short and life can be very very long um, but having that uh, fulfilled life is is the most important thing and, yeah. and interacting with people such as yourself is mm -hmm. is definitely something that I that I have found um, joyful I guess yeah. again in my life well they invited me to the annual not this year because they canceled it but the previous year they had a ceremony their memorial service for people that had been killed mm -hmm. and I they invited me down there and uh, to attend and I really uh, you know ha had the feeling that uh, of remembrance and and of respect for these people that 
no longer with us. And uh, it was a, a wonderful ceremony. They do that every year except for kind of COVID-19. Uh, it was canceled this year. So. Right. Uh, but that was a real treat. And uh, 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 Bob Leindecker and his wife, <laughs> I met them there. And they had, uh, I had no Army uniform at all. And they went and found me an Army uniform. And, and, and I've got it upstairs there now. I keep looking at it. So, so you just, you never do get away from it once you're caught. <laughs> Yeah, now I understand why you were asking if uh, you can get signed back up. I mean, you're getting the uniform, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> but they've oh, been wow. very kind to me. Everybody has been. I just, uh, and when Bob called me, oh, I guess it's maybe six months ago, there was another bomb disposal technician that was 104 years old in the New York area, I believe. Mm. And he passed away. Mm. So me, with my 98 years now, uh, I am proud to say I'm, I'm the last remaining bomb disposal technician that studied at Aberdeen, Maryland. And, uh, yes, sir. And, uh, and I can say this, I said to you before, if I had to go through what you have to go through now, to be uh, elevated to a bomb disposal position. I don't know if I could have made it because they really put you through. And yeah, we, we uh, I mean, it's about 25, you know, 15 to 25 percent of the class passes. And that's, yeah. that's not very many people, no, 15 to 25 percent, no. so. I, 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 my respect went up tenfold when I realized that. And, and I realized it's interesting when I guess it was in Fort Lee or something. Or, uh, part of the program was for me just sitting in a room with some of the uh, soldiers and just asking questions of me. And, and, uh, uh, and this was after I saw what they have to go through to become. Oh. And I, I really, really felt that, you know, uh, I really didn't deserve to be sitting talking oh, to these not, people because nonsense. they did things that we never thought about doing, you know. And at the same time, though, Jerry, you were doing things that were new completely in the military, right? I mean, yeah. you, you started this, you know. Uh, so I, I would say that it's the, the feeling is, is mutual and, it, and it's an amazing experience to be able to, you know, have both sides kind of come well, together. Well, that's true. Uh, nevertheless, you got to respect when you, when somebody comes out of that school, uh, they, they really are, are, are uh, equipped to take on anything that you can find. And it's, it's amazing. And that's something else that I'm, I'm really trying to but I'm hope, hoping to, to remind people, you know, my EOD brothers and sisters, that uh, we have gone through, you know, very difficult training. We have gone through a lot of uh, stressful uh, situations, and, and we are well equipped to, to find um, our purpose in our, our life outside the military. Right. And it just sometimes takes, you know, talking with other people and trusting others and seeking, you know, um, counselors if you need counselors. Um, but we've gone through, you know, enough mental games that if we approach, you know, life after the military as a as another, you know, how do I how do I figure out this puzzle? You know, I, I think we can really do it. In Fort Lee, uh, when General Hoyle was there. They had a contest, and maybe you were, you know, were there teams come in from all over the country? Uh, uh, Ravens, uh, Ravens Challenge? Yeah, and they give them things to, to, to solve, problems to solve. Yes, sir. And I was fascinated <laughs> by that, really fascinated by that. Yes, sir. And, uh, uh, and I realized these people are good. They're really good, and uh, and I 
would think if you didn't feel good about yourself before you started that school, you sure as hell did when you got out of that school <laughs> because you could do what 99% of the people couldn't do. And you volunteered. Yep, right, right. But, uh, but I'm just, uh, I envy them, but I, I really don't, would not like to go through that myself, I'll tell you. I well, I, I know you're getting nervous now. I mean, I, I got some fatigues I'm going to give you, I guess, at the end of this, and you can go through it with me if you want to. It's just, uh, uh, you know, this is all set up. This is all a joke. You know, we got we got the, the van in the back. We're gonna take you to the the bum school <laughs> um, <laughs> next. <laughs> well, the, uh, there was, I would say, a couple of incidents in school that I I, uh, I vividly remember. One was the getting us out of bed early in the morning, taking us it's in Aberdeen, taking us out to the bombing range. And uh, when we had our council meeting before we went out to the field, we were told that uh, this is very important what we're going to do. And you're not even supposed to be allowed to talk to your buddies about it. Because if you do, you'll be court-martialed. Hmm. And so we went out and they had a bunch of bombs out there that they had dropped with an unusual looking fuse. And we were told we were giving a shovel and uh, a wire brush and also told, don't touch it with your hands. Don't touch it with your hands. Hmm. And, but you just clean out around that funny looking fuse and then go on to the next one. And we did that and I guess there was so oh, maybe 15, 20 of these bombs then on the ground. And uh, uh, when we got back to the conference room, he said, thank you very much. He said, and let me tell you one other thing I forgot to tell you. If you talk in your sleep <laughs> and we find out about it, you will be court-martialed. So they're, not, they're not joking around here. And that was the uh, uh, proximity fuse uh, that was being tested, and shortly, uh, not shortly, uh, sometime after that, is that the Japanese fleet in Okinawa was destroyed mm -hmm. because they used that fuse for the first time. And so, so the proximity fuse, it, they they set it to where it crosses a threshold, yep. and then it goes off uh, versus having to hit the target directly, right, which is right. uh, su substantially changes the, it the game. It's just amazing, and I just. Thought, what in the hell are we doing with all this secret business about <laughs> talking in your sleep? And then, I, and then I realized that was, was it. It's a game changer. And I think the other thing that I remember about schooling, the two things, uh, the, uh, the proximity fuse incident and another incident where they took us into a big conference room near the end of our training period. There's a big bench next to the wall, and we sat on that bench, and there was two holes in the wall, big enough to put your hands through. Okay. And on the other side, they had a fuse, <laughs> and you had to take that fuse apart without even seeing it. And that was, that was really, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my buddy next to me, I never forget, says, Hey, I'm going to flunk this test and I'll get out of here. <laughs> At that time, one of the uh, people that were handling the class said, let me tell you something. He heard him say that. He said, you're coming back here and coming back here and coming back here till you pass it. So you better <laughs> do it. Run but that was, that, that was a, an interesting part of the schooling that I remember. And I'm trying to remember just what, what we did. About, all I know is we had to unscrew something. Hmm. and take a part here, a part there, out, and then put it back together. Again. I'm sure there's some, some techs watching right now that are the history buffs. I'm sure they could probably think of which fuse that, that yeah, was. I, I don't know, but that was that was pretty good. And when they probably, if you would ask, well, what was your most sensitive 
experience. And I would say on Okinawa, we, when we left uh, Hawaii, we were on an LST boat, flat bottom boat, and I highly recommend that you never go on one because I got seasick before oh, no. we pulled out of the dock. The boat was oh. clear. <laughs> we got to Okinawa, <laughs> and uh, when Okinawa surrendered, some of the Japanese uh, escaped and hit out for the mountains, the hills. Hmm. And since that was going to be, I believe, I'm guessing now, a stepping stone to taking taking this whole, all of Japan out, because you almost can throw a rock from uh, Okinawa to, uh, to Main, Japan. Mainland. Okay. And um, so they take us out to the field, and again they give us a wire brush and, and a little spade. And we had probably built one of the biggest ammunition storage places in the service on Okinawa <laughs> for this big step on to Japan. Yeah, I could see that. Well, these people that escaped came out at night looking for food and ammunition, mm. okay? And they got into that ammunition dump and set something off mm. and it blew stuff up the size of three or four football fields and we had to go through because I wanted to give the land back to the, to the natives and we had to go through four in the front row two in the back row about seven feet apart and walk down to the end Ooh. of the tape and turn around and come back the other way and we were told, he said, you guys are lucky. <laughs> the guy said, you've got a choice. And we said, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. <laughs> he said, you can either pick it up. No, I'm sorry. You can either kick it <laughs> or pick it up and inert it. And most of the stuff that we inerted was, was hand grenades. Oh, okay. And they gave us a bunch of pins and handles when we started. <laughs> And one, on one of our expeditions on that, somebody in the front row, I was in the back row with two. This kid must have found something that looked suspicious and he got the full round top of the smoke, he picked it up mm. and tried to throw it. Well, he's close enough to us that he didn't want to try to wind up. Right. He tried to underhand. Mm. And he picked it up. And in that whole area, there probably was three trees. <laughs> Just three trees in this whole big area. And I'll be damned if he didn't <laughs> hit that tree. I mean, he threw it underhand, hit the tree, bounced back, and landed between the two. Oh, trees. my gosh. And it just fizzed. Oh. He said, hit the dirt. No bulldozers boats are ever dug a hole as quickly as we did. I bet. That's right. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> So he, he loved it. Uh, it he, came right back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he <laughs> like just hit that tree and bounced back. And, and, and oh. it just fell back and it kept on fizzling and died. Just fizzled Ooh. out. And so. My heart's beating uh, fast now. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was something I, uh, I'll remember for a while. Yeah. I'm going to remember that now, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, but then, you know, then after, I think it was. Oh, a couple of months of that is when I got a call to go to Tokyo, mm. and uh, I was glad. I I didn't like that work, but, uh, but See, it was good just to get get out of, get get out of it for a while, you know. Yes, sir. Yeah. But, but it's nice we can talk about it and, and uh, living long enough to talk about it. So. Yeah, well, it's 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 a <laughs> it's a real pleasure yeah. uh, to hear these stories too, Jerry. Yeah. It's uh, it's a lot of fun hearing them. Uh, yeah. I still can't believe that uh, there's not much that's changed. You know, like uh, we ha we have what's called a Murphy's Law, which is you know if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. You know, mentality, and you just proved a perfect point with your friend. You know, yeah. under under yeah. there's three trees. <laughs> yeah. If it can go wrong, 
<laughs> Good. Uh, uh, no, it's uh, it was a good experience. I'm glad I it's behind me, and I'm glad we were able to do what we could do. But uh, but it, it amazes me today, even today, when I volunteer for uh, the hospital, the VA hospital, mm. and uh, because of the. Uh, virus and the fact that I have had to have, have a recent operation and so forth, I'm, I'm on leave from my volunteer job. Okay. But, uh, but it's, uh, it's nice to be able to do something, uh, you know, for, for the military. And I know when I'm sitting at my desk there, I have to wear my hat. A lot of people come up and say, "Hey, were you really in bond disposal?" <laughs> I say, "Yes, sir." And I got five fingers on this hand, five on this hand, five toes on each hand. But, and they say, "God, you must have really been good." I said, "Hell no, I was just lucky." Just lucky. <laughs> just lucky. And uh, it, it, it's nice to hear somebody say that <laughs> once in a while. But uh, uh, I'm sure of it. But no, I, uh, I've enjoyed it, and, 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 and to be very modest, I, I really needed it when I first hit here because you don't stop working overnight and not have some repercussions. But well, that's, that's the lesson that I want. Um, that's one of the many lessons that we've talked about today or, or things that we've talked about that I think are so important, Jerry. And thank you for, for being uh, open about that because it's it's not easy to to say uh, and to realize that if you do stop working or if you do uh, sit around all day, there's only so long you can do that for yeah. before it's not. We need a purpose in life. We we need, yeah. we need something to go do. We you know it's really important. To, it's important to me to get out there and and enjoy the day to the fullest, whether that's yeah. helping somebody or or doing one of these live streams. You know it's. It's well, really tell important. Me, so after you put all these interviews together, what happens then? Okay, so uh, so this this interview will will have it um, uploaded tonight. Um, so we're gonna put out like you know two or three episodes each week. Yeah. And uh, so people can subscribe. Yeah, I think it's we have like five dollar, ten dollar, and fifteen dollar subscriptions, and they can watch these these videos, uh, these interviews, and we'll cut clips of them, and and put them on YouTube. And um, in 15 months, I'm doing this for 15 months, so until next November. Um, and that's uh, on Veterans Day of next November, I'm gonna try to get like a big um, conference. A week from this coming November, in other words. Not this, yeah, a year from this coming November. Yeah. So 2022, um, and try to have like a big, um, you know, thank you uh, kind of celebration. Um, but there's, there's no, uh, there's no, there's no like a documentary like coming out on Netflix or anything like that. If that's what yeah. you're asking, it's it's just uh, it's just me going on the road and trying to do these uh, for the next 15 months as much as I can. Will, will you have this on a CD by any chance? I will. I I, I bought a, a DVD burner just so I could burn it and uh, I'll send it to you. I would like that. That's all I ask is so I can show my kids. And that's. Uh, an, that's one of the reasons why, why I'm doing this, Jerry, is because I, I think that it's so, uh, we're at a pivotal mo moment in human history yep. when we have the ability to go around and capture these stories and, and pass them on to, to future generations. My, my grandfather is, is uh, passed. Um, both of my grand grandfathers were in World War II, and I have no video of them talking about yeah. their experiences. And uh, so this is very personal for me. And, and I, I thank you, because I, oh, I feel like I'm making up for lost, lost time with my grandparents. I feel honored. I just feel very honored to do it. And, uh, but I wish, like I say, since getting out doing this kind of work, lectures, and uh, uh, elevating me to an honorary membership in the EOD, because bomb disposal well, EOD must have started about the early 50s. Yes, sir. 
And uh, when it started, and bomb disposal was done, uh, and uh, I think the EOD incorporated uh, the Army, the Navy, uh, the Air Corps, and bomb disposal as we know it today. Yes, sir. Into one group. Oh, and the Marines. Let's not forget the Marines. Don't want oh, any sorry. Marines. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, and. Uh, and I can understand after I had the uh, good fortune of uh, uh, being able to go into their equipment room at Fort Carson, and when they showed me uh, uh, things, well, uh, I tell a funny story on myself. You know, I wanted to shake hands with everybody and. I introduced myself and I was looking over in the corner, I started over the corner and said, where are you going? I said, go over there. She said, she said that's, a, that's a robot over there. That ain't a human being. I said, and I take a look and I said, you're right. Yeah. But it looked almost too good to be true. But then when they yeah, showed me their One of the things that they do, you know, you always hear about finding a box that's taped up someplace and you want to go into it and, well, they had some kind of a gadget there <laughs> that they could look inside that box and they could read something that was a sixteenth of an inch. Uh, yeah, x-ray machine, it's basically an x-ray machine. Uh, 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 yeah, and I said, my God. No wonder they don't have to worry about opening it up. They can see what's in it. And, but and, and then, then we use that information to find out where to hit it yeah, you know, with, right. a, with another remote device. Right. I so. thought that was... And they showed me all kind of things there. I just uh, was amazed, uh, amazed that... <laughs> I said, you don't want to shake hands with him because that's a robot. <laughs> uh, anyhow... Uh, no, they, they they have really treated me so nicely here well, at Fort Carson. Well, it's 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 uh, very nice of you to give give your time. Oh, so well, I'm sure that feeling's mutual. Uh, I, 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 I'll show you when you pack up. I'll go up and get a couple of pictures. Oh, you didn't take a picture on the wall. Did you? No, I didn't. I didn't. I need to take a picture. Yep. Uh, will you do that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Uh, that I'd like to see. And uh, 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 I'm pretty proud. That's of all the things they've given me. I think <laughs> the honorary membership really meant something to me. And uh, well, we'll get a picture of that. Yeah. But, uh, But thank God it's so worth and way behind us too. <laughs> way behind us. I think it's way behind us. I don't know uh, what's going on, you know. Yes, sir. Uh, well, um, oh, sorry, I didn't mean it. I was trying to get mine. Um, let's do. Um, let's do this. Let's go ahead and uh, I'll let you kind of close out this uh, this interview, and then I'll start packing up, um, and then we'll go upstairs. I'll get that picture and yeah. I have a uh, I have a drone. I was gonna ask you to to take a picture with me with my drone uh to get kind of a cool uh yeah. cool air, air you know picture so we can do that as well does okay. that sound like a plan yeah whatever you like to do is fine and in closing all i can say is thank you for giving me an opportunity to be Absolutely. part of this project that you're on and that uh and that I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to share some of these things with people that are interested in this thing. Jerry, uh, it's an absolute honor, brother. Uh, you're quite welcome. All right. Well, well, thank you guys so much for watching. We're going to pack up. Yes. And we'll see you all later. Thank you. Uh,